Thank you. Um, such kindness. The first, before I get started, I would like to pay my respects to my friend Lisa Lena, who is, you probably know, died earlier this year. My immediate inclination, as Dylan Thomas wrote, is to rage against the dying of the light, of which there was quite a lot that day in Finland. But I think it's better and more appropriate and more useful for us to look at her smile and take that, as I have found it to be, a sign of this community and its welcoming nature. <clears throat> Perhaps it's needless to say that I am greatly honored for, by this award for several reasons but especially because it is given by me mates, by the community of people among whom a quarter century ago I found the intellectual home where I have thrived and prospered. I've thought long and hard about what to say on this occasion, whether to present new results or to make something of how I got here from there. I've decided to do both. New results because I suffer from intellectual claustrophobia and want reactions to the cure I'm taking. Retrospection because this occasion demands that a life of learning be told as a meaningful story. I begin with retrospection shaped by a moral. I can't give you anything like a, a career path because there was none. My trackless wanderings were affected by far too many accidents, though I like to think steadily driven by a hunger for learning. Let me just say that I came to the PhD in Milton Studies in 1976 with training in physics, English, German, and Latin literature, and mathematics, and years spent as a programmer in Fortran and assembly language on some very big machines. Eight years of obsessive devotion to John Milton's biblical and classical sources earned me the PhD in 1984. The plan was to become a professor of English. Instead, I became an English professor, but that's a story in the future. <clears throat> but that didn't happen despite very powerful help. I spent a dozen years in academic limbo. While there, I reverted to computing, fell into humanities computing, as we called it then, learned a lot about other people's research, and plunged into a prolonged study of Ovid's Metamorphoses, by which I had become captivated. Its structure fascinated me. How, I wondered, did the poem manage so successfully to tease us with the promise of structure, yet always elude our grasp? Like Father Buza before me, I turned to computing for help on a smaller scale, but for the same reasons. Markup seemed the obvious way to go. SGML was at the time the standard, I think. TEI is yet unborn. I created my own scheme. Don't try to understand it, but <laughs> see all the, uh, the curly brackets. I rejected SGML to make sure that my thinking would be as free from pre-existing theoretical commitments as possible. I targeted names, which I reasoned were literary enough to tell me about structure, verbal enough to handle with a machine. About 60,000 tags resulted. That is an average of five per line of poetry. I worked on it both alone and with research assistants in Toronto and then in London after moving there in 1996. Finally abandoning it, it was never published, when at last I realized that markup was radically wrong for the job. Indeed, that no conceivable technology would prove remotely adequate. But no matter, those years of work had already led me to the vein of gold I have been following ever since, an idea of what happens when Mr. Turing's implemented idea of mathematical rigor meets the fluid metamorphic genius of poetry. Now back up some years. 
In April 1987, at the International Conference for Computers and the Humanities in Columbia, South Carolina, I met Michael Sperberg McQueen, whose eloquent rhetoric stirred up the righteous discontent of colleagues there who, like me, were languishing on the academic periphery. Humanist was the result. I threw myself into it, never for a moment thinking it would pay off. How wrong I was. Nearly a decade later, in 1996, Harold Short, whom I met in Toronto because of Humanist, changed everything by seeing to it that I was propelled quite expectedly across the pond into my first academic appointment, which I still hold. Now, I promised you a moral to this story, which I take from the great 12th century Jewish philosopher Moshe ben Maimon's commentary on the Mishnah. Whatever you do, do it only out of love. And from the physician Thomas Fuller's Nomologia in 1732, I draw these helpful proverbs to hammer it home. He that hath love in his breast hath spurs at his heels. Love will creep where it cannot go. Love liveth more in cottages than courts. The soul is not where it lives, but where it loves. To put the matter more viscerally and personally, I didn't walk a career path, but followed the smell of food on the wind. And here I am to say thank you for all the friendship, inspiration, sustenance, audience, and now this, in the name of the great Jesuit scholar, Roberto Buza. Mille grazie. And to these two characters, special mention. The one on the left, you all know. The one on the right got me to Australia, got me to Sydney, which as you know, also all know, is the place to be in 2015. And with your indulgence, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to my great predecessor and friend, John Burroughs. But I do wonder on this occasion, why me? I am quite an old-fashioned scholar who works by himself, shuns collaborative teams and the grants that fuel them, who has written no code for decades, knows not TEI, and teaches solely face to face. For many years, I have insisted, contrary to Ronald Reagan, when he worked as a promo man for General Electric, that failure is our most important product. Partly for the shock value as antidote to the hype of pervasive techno triumphalism, but also to stress that computing is an ongoing, never ending experimental process. I've argued that the main thing is to fail so well that all you can see is Jerry McGann's hem of a quantum garment. <laughs> a phrase he used, you may recall, to describe the intractable, non-residual leftovers markup cannot capture, hence its potential for illumination. My struggle with the metamorphoses laid groundwork for my book, Humanities Computing, published in 2005. 20 years earlier, Brian Cantwell Smith had observed that computers can only approximate reality according to a necessarily simplified, hence incorrect, model of it. So I could see that in principle, my attempts to pin Ovid down were bound to fail. But by the time I came to think about Ovid, two things had happened. Progress had liberated digital computing from its confinement to mainframes, giving me a little machine of my own to play with, and I had met the great Australian ethno-historian Greg Denning, who introduced me to the participle. So I could see that Brian had fastened on the wrong part of speech. Modeling, not model, had to be the central idea. <clears throat> In other words, I rediscovered the essential truth of the hacker's hands-on imperative against the industrializing effects of batch mode computing, and so the book. But then, as always, intellectual claustrophobia took hold. By demonstrating the conceptual inadequacy of our tools, modeling the metamorphoses had left me nowhere to go. And modeling itself was at once too pat an answer, 
and unable to do more than work through the consequences of interpretation that had already happened elsewhere by other means. Coming to the end of my own road alerted me to others whose fate I shared, and so to wonder if I might figure a way out by finding out what it had been like for them, hence my turn to history. What I found, and what I think it amounts to, <clears throat> forms the rest of this lecture. But I'm going to tell you a particular kind of story, which I learned about from Ian Hacking, to whom I owe so much, who learned about it from Michel Foucault, a history of the present, Foucault called it, because it sets out to recognize and distinguish historical objects in order to illumine our own predicaments. Writing in 1940 with the Gestapo at his heels, Walter Benjamin put the case more starkly, exactly as we need it to be. To articulate the past historically does not mean to recognize it the way it really was. It means to seize hold of a memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger. In every era, the attempt must be made anew to wrest tradition away from a conformism that is about to overpower it. Only the historian will have the gift of fanning the spark of hope in the past, who is firmly convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. And this enemy has not ceased to be victorious. For us, the danger is that our being of, as well as in the humanities, remain an unanswered, even unasked question. It is the predicament Steve Ramsey describes so well in Reading Machines, published in 2011, the almost total grip of hermeneutical inhibitions on digital humanities to the point of willful blindness to the centrality of interpretation. The primary historical object I want to bring into focus and call on for help is the otherness of computing, not its user-friendliness, ubiquitous presence, or social power. I should add, I have nothing against Samsung Galaxy S4. I have one. <laughs> I want to grab onto the fear this otherness provokes and reach through it to the otherness of the techno-scientific tradition from which computing comes. I want to recognize and identify this fear of otherness, that is, the uncanny, as, for example, Sigmund Freud, Stanley Cavill, and Masahiro Mori have identified it, to argue that this otherness is to be sought out and cultivated, not concealed, avoided, or overcome, that its sharp opposition to our somnolence of mind is true friendship. To accomplish this, I'll begin by probing our professional literature, then move outward from that literature in two stages, expanding the historical context as I go. I shall concentrate on literary computing to simplify, I hope not falsify, the bigger picture. But before I start that, allow me to moralize a bit more, this time to advance the acquisitive hunger for learning. This hunger is obviously one of my besetting sins, but I have two good reasons for not repenting. One is to explore and draw attention to the default condition of research nowadays made all but unavoidable by the wealth of online resources. The other reason is to promote the ingathering of intellectual sustenance that we so desperately require. Nelson Goodman has observed that quotation is a tool of world making. We have a world to make. Do you know the story of Ruth the Moabite, of her gleaning in Boaz's field in order to feed her mother-in-law and herself? So I say are we, Ruth-like as a young discipline, migrants in need of food of others, which is of course lying on the ground, that is in libraries and online, freely for the taking, in seemingly endless and compelling abundance. Make no mistake about it, we are surrounded by mature, subtle civilizations of inquiry, whose intellectual resources dwarf our own in volume, variety, and sophistication. I think, for example, of philosopher Miles Berniet's message from Heraclitus, 1985, or Lionel Trilling's On the Teaching of Modern Literature, 1965. 
I wonder after catching my breath, when will we be able to write with such a deep and far-reaching power? We may be smart, we may have the wind in our sails, but raw intellect alone and popularity aren't enough. Being in possession of our own island of knowledge, autonomous with our own agenda, when at last we have one, conferences and publications, all that is necessary, but it is not enough. We need far more than the luck of the moment, dozens of sessions at the MLA, that camps everywhere, millions of tweets, thousands of blogs, and so on and so forth. We need resonance with the intellectual cultures of the arts and humanities, just as a great organ needs an acoustically adequate space for its music to resonate with the listener. <clears throat> and that's not all. We also need the techno sciences just as much as more than many of us realize, more than some of us fear. Scientism is a problem, but without the sciences, we denature the technological side of our discipline by severing it from its epistemological roots. We have much to learn from the technologically aware artists, such as Stellark and Marcel Lee Antunes Roca, who are far less confused about the sciences than we seem to be. Both of them performed at the recent IEEE International Conference on Robotics and Automation, where some of us spoke on robotics and the humanities. I was reminded of the 1968 Cybernetic Serendipity Exhibition in London, at which artists and engineers experimented with ideas so far ahead of their time that they remain mostly ahead of ours. We have much to learn as well from the scholar writers with strong scientific interests such as Gillian Beer, who works on Darwin, Laura Otis on 19th century technology, and Antonia Byatt, whose fascination with the sciences informs her fiction. And near at hand as well is the disciplinary bridge built by historians, philosophers, and sociologists of science, open to us in the early 1960s, when, in Hacking's words, philosophers finally unwrapped the cadaver they had made of science and saw the remnants of an historical process of becoming and discovering. To many of us, alas, there is still only the cadaver. Some hallucinate a zombie. Where and what are we amidst all this abundance? Do we even know it exists? I've imagined us as maritime explorers in an archipelago of disciplines, peripatetic, prowling the margins. I've imagined us with the novelist David Maloof, adventurous youth discovering life and death in a wild, dangerous acre of bush, with Greg Denning on the edge of things in a great ring of viewers, with historian Peter Gallison in the trading zone, or as Denning says, on the beaches of the mind. And this is why I am so very pleased to be named the Obi-Wan Kenobi of digital humanities, to be honored for the marginal peripatetic life of learning, I have been able to lead and continue Deo Volente to live with you. If only I had a jalaba to wear on this occasion, and so could appear more like Obi-Wan, an aromatic elder possessed of powers beyond the ordinary, kindly but serious, and not to be messed with. <laughs> These are not the droids you are looking for. <laughs> And I'm also thrilled to be linked through him to Sir Alec Guinness. When Sir Alec was interviewed on the BBC Radio 4 program, Desert Island Discs, in 1977, just prior to the release of Star Wars, he, had, he was asked what role he was playing in that film. He answered, I don't know what I play, a wise old and allegedly wise old character from outer space. But however Obi-Wanish, I cannot agree to wise. Old, I will not admit to. And as far as I know, I came into the world in the way of all flesh and was raised in a small California town. Though my brother, who still lives there, tells me that flying saucers regularly visit the area. Now back to Earth, <coughs> to the present, to our world building. The raw, the raw material is abundantly to hand. What do we do with it? 
After a talk at Cambridge last year, I was asked by the historian of ancient science, Jeffrey Lloyd, one of those questions I live to be asked. Where would we be with our digital scholarship in 20 years? On what did I think our sights could most ambitiously be set? What I fumbled to say then, I am still fumbling with, but here's another go. I spoke earlier of computing's otherness, a more dramatic way of referring to the distancing effect Julia Flanders has gently called productive unease. Julia makes a strong case for the contribution of the digital humanities in foregrounding issues of how we model the sources we study in such a way that these issues cannot be sidestepped. I know this to be true from long experience unable to sidestep them. But what about those for whom digital resources are made, who aren't themselves makers? I know I'm not the first to find fault with principles of design that conceal the difficulties and provide no means of struggling with them. There are deep, tough questions here as to how and at what level the essential struggle is enacted. But Julia's point remains. The struggle is the point of it all. And we do not, or should not, emerge from it unscathed. Again and again, I will insist on this. Being scathed is paradoxically our salvation. Love may be an ever-fixed mark. We humans aren't. If we are not changed by computing, we're imprisoned by it. This struggle is a nascent form of reasoning that we have done for millennia with tools, of course. But the potential hardly realized is for reasoning to evolve in concert with a radically adaptive tool, something more than the steersman's tiller that inspired cybernetics, less perhaps than a conversational partner, but almost that. As we get close to conversational machines, it's only a matter of time, our attempts produce in Robert Hughes' famous phrase, the shock of the new. We share with the roboticists the chance, in Warren McCullough's words, to ride the shock wave by engaging deliberately with that miscegenation of art and science which begets inanimate objects that behave like living systems. I call the result catastrophic in Stephen Jay Gould's evolutionary sense as that which punctuates the equilibrium of which we are a living part and so instant it initiates developmental change. Such a catastrophe implies a deep, not merely utilitarian relationship between machine and human. Again, the artists are there. In 1935, the Polish artist Bruno Schulz compared the work of art to a baby in the midst of being born, still operating at a pre-moral depth. The role of art, he wrote, is to be a probe sunk into the nameless. What comes out is an uncannily us and other, or to put it another way, an invitation to a becoming. So also for technologies. Those who attended the ACH ALLC conference at Queens in 1997 will have heard the Canadian cognitive psychologist Merlin Donald describe how from earliest times we have externalized ourselves in tools that have then remade us by changing what we can do, how we see the world and each other. Thus the technological shape of hominin biocultural co-evolution in concert with material affordances, as Gary Tomlinson has argued for music. Laura Otis, whom I mentioned earlier, has traced just such an interrelation of inventor and invention much closer to our own time in communication technologies and ideas of human neurophysiology from the mid-19th century. In the 20th century, computer and brain created a like feedback relation. From Alan Turing's abstract machine in 1936, itself based on how a bureaucrat would do his sums, to Warren McCullough's and Walter Pitt's model of the brain as a Turing machine in 1943. From their neurophysiological model to John von Neumann's computer architecture in 1945, which he, inspired by McCullough and Pitts, described in neurophysiological terms. And from that architecture to a modular conception of mind, which reflected it. Back and forth, back and forth. In 1948, von Neumann proposed that the problem of imitating natural intelligence might better be done with a network that will fit 
into the actual volume of the human brain. <coughs> As I speak, the DARPA Synapse Program is working toward precisely that goal, using, using neuromorphic hardware which reflects current ideas of neuro, neurological plasticity. The pace of development is now so fast that neurophysiological models of consciousness and architectures of computing are a blurry chicken and egg. But that's precisely my point. The traffic between self-conception and invention is two-way, and what comes from it is what hacking calls a metamorphic looping effect. I want to ask what we can do to make that traffic go for us and for the humanities. <coughs> Another bit of autobiography to get us there. By the time I was done with humanities computing, McGann had come up with some powerful theories we might use to get us moving beyond the four courts of interpretation where we were stalled. Being stuck myself, I went for his gift basket of theories, but I could not see any rationale for choice. Since theories to some degree set forth the direction of future research and embody assumptions about the world in which they operate, choice is absolutely crucial. The wrong choice potentially ruinous. To ask whether a research of a field should go in the direction expressed or implied by a theory, practitioners must have a good idea of where the field has been. They need history. I decided to focus on the history of what I will call the incunabular period, from a beginning in the late 1940s to the public release of the web in 1991. I had two reasons. The period is neatly delimited, and historians love that. But more importantly, it defines a time we have good cause to believe was formative. This gave me confidence to think that despite the dramatic changes brought about by the web, I could determine at least some parameters for a trajectory and so uncover a range of genuine possibilities for the future. The historical evidence is fascinating as well as abundant, but constraints of time force me now to skim very quickly over it. Within the incunabular period, the relevant literature in the Anglophone world, at least, defines a core of three decades, from the early 1960s to the early 1990s. These decades are bracketed by two pairs of evaluative statements. The first pair argued that the then dominant use of computing to alleviate drudgery was skewing the focus of research toward problems of drudgery and away from imaginative exploration. The second pair, summing up what had been done by 1991, argues that it had not worked, that the field had been steadfastly ignored by mainstream scholars because it was theory poor, that it should turn to what Franco Moretti was almost a decade later to call distant reading. During those three decades, Buza was among the very few who insisted that the point was not saving labor, but more human work, more mental effort, to know more systematically deeper and better. A few others insisted along with him that the point was not to design for efficient servitude, but to realize that computing was something altogether new and to find out what that was. The brilliant experiments of cybernetic artists to which I referred earlier, not just in London, but also in Zagreb, Paris, New York, Sydney, and elsewhere, gave glimpses of what could be done with what would seem to us smoke and mirrors. Thus the poignancy of Busa's question in 1976 on behalf of philology. Why can a computer do so little? Buza, given his analytic philological focus, pointed to the sophistication of human language. This answer serves us well to explain why the pioneering work in computational stylistics, first by John Burroughs, then also Hugh Craig, David Hoover, Tomoji Tabata, Jan Rybicki, and others, and now for literary history by Matt Jockers and former colleagues at the Stanford Lit Lab, has been so long in the oven. It is the great exception to the stalemate that concerns me here. It is exceptional and really should rock our colleagues because it has produced mounting evidence, as Burroughs says, that literature is probabilistic. Hence, and this is the shock, that the most elusive of cultural qualities behaves in the same way as we know the natural world behaves. But the cause of this work's obscurity to most of us, the fear of the mathematical, 
turns us to the, returns us to the stalemate that concerns me here. What is it about numbers that frightens us away? What are we frightened of? What, what does this fright tell us about the relationship we have to digital machinery? Let me work toward an answer by revising Booz's question. Not why can the computer do so little, but why were those historical scholars doing so little with it? What was stopping or inhibiting them? We know, thanks to the cybernetic artists, that primitive kit cannot be blamed. Many practitioners of the time worried about evident lack of progress and its causes. But what matters historically is more the fact of their worrying than the blame fixing they indulged in. Paying attention to this fact foregrounds the anomalous expressions of worry, which point not to the difficulty of the problems, but rather to intimations of a contest, which, as in Turing's paper of 1950, humans and machines would become indistinguishable, or as in contemporary fiction and fantasy, machines would prove vastly superior. Fear not so much of computing as summoned by it, I concluded, was the problem. But why? This fear was expressed in several forms. Fear of the distortions computing would work on the humanities if taken seriously, evinced by the work and words of those who did take it seriously. Fear of its success in mechanizing scholarship, dehumanizing it and leaving scholars little to do. Fear of its revolutionary force, threatening to cast aside old-fashioned ways of thinking and fear implied by curiously gratuitous reassurances that all would be well, that the scholar would not be put out of work. It was fundamentally an existential angst, a fear and trembling, as one scholar said, quoting Søren Kierkegaard. How do we explain such evidence? Here is where the real task of history writing begins, in moving outward from the professional literature, heavily filtered by academic decorum, into the social setting in which our predecessors lived, blaming, as some have done, a boogeyman of our particular disliking, French critical theory is a favorite, only grants it causal powers it did not have. All were part of the same world. What was that world like? Our predecessors were ordinary people, just as we are, living more or less ordinary lives. What was ordinary life actually like for them? Consider now the unplanned, casual encounters we can suppose they had with newspapers, magazines, neighbors, shopkeepers, radio, and television as soon as there was television. The detail I must skip over is painful to omit as it conjures the scene so effectively. But let me put rapidly before you just two sets of images, utopic and dystopic, with which the mass media of the time were then saturated. First, the computer as Sibylline Oracle. Superhuman intelligence. Suitor to the lonely. And riveting educational toy. Second, the computer as military weapon and countermeasure. Automator of industrial production akin to the slave master. Agent of job loss. And giant brain on the verge of outthinking man. Note the date of Edmund Berkeley's book. All of this, whether at home or at work, was framed and informed by the defining context of computing in its infancy, the Cold War. So named by George Orwell, two months after the atom bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, 9th August, 1945. Just one incident will do to conjure what it was like. The widely publicized near miss on 5th October, 1960, when an incorrect software model caused a rising moon, the rising moon, to be falsely identified as a Soviet missile attack. All out nuclear war was barely avoided. In 1985, at a symposium on unintentional nuclear war, Brian Cantwell Smith, in that paper on modeling I cited earlier, demonstrated that in principle, 
no foolproof system was possible. There would always be another such moonrise, as he said. Children on both sides of the Atlantic, I was one of these, practiced variants of duck and cover, drive, diving under desks in school to be ready for the bomb. Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, 1964, told a story we knew to be plausible because we were almost living it. So what do we make of all this? First, the obvious, that the Cold War gives us good, if partial, explanation for scholars' timidity in the real or imagined presence of mainframe systems that were other to most humanists because physically, culturally alien and obviously complicit. But it also helps to explain the curious departure of the scholarly mainstream from the kinds of inquiry computing was most nearly suited for just at the time when computing became available. Anthony Kenny has speculated that the majority turned away from computing to critical theory in fear of quantification. There's truth to that guess, just as there is reason behind practitioners' opposition to critical theory, but both underplay the positive, indeed visionary, hunger for theorizing as a liberating practice. Students were, as one said, theory hungry. The evidence suggests that they and their theorizing professors did not so much flee from computing as run toward and embrace powerful means of asking, in Terry Eagleton's words, the most embarrassingly general and fundamental questions regarding routine social practices with a wondering estrangement which we have forgotten. The mechanizers had nothing for them. The public release of the web in 1991, coinciding almost exactly with the end of the Cold War, was a radical game changer. But as others have remarked, the web did not address the stalemate in analytical computing. Rather, it shifted attention to the stocking of the great virtual shelves. The web buried the problem rather than solved it. And by being so very useful and saleable to colleagues, web-based resources did little to bring our discipline in from the cold intellectually. Hence, with the thrusting of the digital humanities into the limelight, the old complaints and problems have resurfaced unresolved. First, the intellectual relation of theorizing to making and of scholarship to technical skills. Second, the external relation of digital practices to the techno-sciences on the one hand and to the non-technical humanities on the other. Third, the still unknown basis for a normal discourse that would allow us to speak coherently to the other disciplines. Ellen Yu has asked, where is the cultural criticism in digital humanities? But prior to and inclusive of that question is Fred Gibbs' simpler one, I think better one. Where is the criticism in digital humanities? Gibbs' question is better because criticism grown from within a hands-on digital humanities does not allow us, in Dominic Le Capra's words, to trope away from specificity and generalize hyperbolically through an extremely abstract mode of discourse that may at, at times serve as a surrogate for experience. Ungrounded theorizing is as much an enemy as no theorizing at all. But what both questions point to is that theoretical poverty which has vexed the field for decades. It may seem with all this activity that the revolution has begun, but actually it's been, been proclaimed many times before. For example, at the first conference in the field in 1964 by Stephen Parrish, but then postponed for technical reasons. That's Mike Mahoney's phrase, not mine. The truth is that the great cognitive revolution for us has not begun even once. Natalia Cecere, I hope I'm pronouncing her word correctly and I hope she's here, is right on when she argues that the central problematic in humanities plus computing is the plus. That so far we've construed the joining to be merely additive rather than transformative. The amassing of well-presented data is continuing to change conditions of scholarly work, and with them, I suspect, much else, but this is not addressing the old problem of how we are of the humanities. It does not help us with what that plus means, what it portends, what it entails. 
That's why I've embarked on a history of the present. It demands use of the past to point the way forward. If long ago scholars came to the crossroads, to that plus sign, and were frightened either into retreating or into reducing the challenges of the machine to something comfortable, like minimizing drudgery or mining data, we find now, if we find now, that we are still there, wondering what to do analytically, but cannot, despite healthy skepticism, shake the sense that what we know to do is only a poor beginning. Then that old fright is a treasure to be used, not just understood. <coughs> it directs us to the uncanny moment. What matters is our response to us, as Benjamin said. What matters is our trajectory into the future. When Father Buza asked why the computer could do so little for philology, he meant in relation to the monumental services done elsewhere, especially in the sciences. In the mid-1960s, in artificial intelligence, machine translation, and humanities computing, the honeymoon period came almost simultaneously to an end. All three suffered notorious disappointments, as Cambridge Lucassian professor Sir James Lighthill said of machine translation in 1972. His sentence for AI can stand for them all. In no part of the field have the discoveries made so far produced the major impact that then was promised. But note, AI absorbed the shock and continued. Computational linguistics was born out of machine translation and thrived. Humanities computing ground to a halt. Changing the name to digital humanities and being popular with the boys and girls does not, suffer, does not solve the fundamental problem. <coughs> now compare the sciences. <coughs> the extent of computing's influence on them is unabashedly summarized by philosopher Paul Humphreys in his book, Extending Ourselves, Computational Science, Empiricism, and Scientific Method, 2004. Because of computing, Humphrey observes, scientific epistemology is no longer human epistemology. He concludes in language reminiscent of Milton's Paradise Lost. The Copernican Revolution, he writes, first removed humans from their position at the center of the physical universe, and science has now driven humans from the center of the epistemological universe. Whether he is right for my purposes is beside the point. What matters is his language, specifically his echo of Adam's and Eve, Adam and Eve's expulsion from paradise. So what's going on? The best known and most fruitful pronouncement of the kind is Sigmund Freud's. Twice in 1919, he declared that scientific research had precipitated three great crises in human self-conception or as he put it, three great outrages, Grosse Krankungen. First, as with Humphreys, by Copernican cosmology, which decentered humankind. Then by Darwinian evolution, which dethroned us, setting in motion discoveries of how intimately we belong to life. And finally, of course, by his own psychoanalysis, which showed we are not even masters of our own house. Less often noticed is his suggestion, implicit, in the German Krenkung from Krank, ill, sick, diseased, that these, these diseasings of mind can be turned to therapeutic effect. Now we are apt to see only the physician here, but Freud was in fact showing his inheritance from the whole moral tradition of the physical sciences. At least from Bacon and Galileo in the 17th century, this tradition had identified the cognitively and morally curative function of science acting against fanciful or capricious knowledge. The sciences as one would, Bacon called it. Science for them was a corrective, restorative force. The moral enterprise of freedom for the inquiring mind, historian Alistair Crombie has written. We now know that it's, in its origin, science was not anti-religious. Its aim was restoration of cognitively diseased humankind to prelapsarian Adamic intelligence. The religious language has gone from science, of course, but the moral imperative remains. Freud's series of outrages is thus radically incomplete. They do not stop with him, 
because the imperative to correct the sciences as one would is integral to the scientific program. But the high moral purpose acquires a dark side when, scientific pers when the scientific perspective is taken to be absolute, reducing human imaginings to narcissism on a cosmic scale. Consider, for example, cosmologist and Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg, who, like Freud, takes aim at this narcissism, proclaiming that we live in an overwhelmingly hostile universe whose laws are impersonal and free from human values as the laws of arithmetic. That human life is a more or less farcical outcome of a chain of accidents reaching back to the first three minutes after the Big Bang. If that's not enough, consider the words of geneticist and Nobel laureate Jacques Monod, who aims at the same target, proclaiming that, like a gypsy, man lives on the boundary of an alien world that is deaf to his music and is indifferent to his hopes as it is to his suffering or his crimes. A Blakeian nobodaddy is in the pulpit. Gleefully telling us deluded children to grow up and face facts. However extreme Weinberg and Monod may be, they are indicative of a much broader sense of a mounting attack of ourselves as scientists upon ourselves as humans, summed up by the biological anthropologist Melvin Connor. It would seem, he concludes, that we are sorted to a pulp caught in a vice made on the one side of the increasing power of evolutionary biology and on the other of the relentless duplication of human mental faculties by increasingly subtle and complex machines. He asks, so what is left of us? This question and the vision it encapsulates lie close to the recent origins of the so-called post-human condition, which is likewise both feared and celebrated by cultural critics as the end of an old conception of humanity. I'll return to it in a moment. But note, doesn't Connor's question sound familiar? Isn't it formally the same question that Julia's encoder constantly asks, mindful of the productive unease from which she struggles to learn? Isn't it the same question Jerry McGann has illumined by that reach for the hem of a quantum garment when all else but the inexplicable anomaly has been nailed down? Again, the claustrophobia which signals a world outgrown and, transformed, and a transformed one in the offing, a catastrophe which punctuates the old equilibrium, precipitating a new order of things, a new idea of the human. <clears throat> the cultural criticism that Alan Liu says we lack converges on much the same crisis of the human as the sciences, though it does not spare them. A good many theorizations of the postmodern, Hans Bertrand writes, suggests that for some time now, we have been finding ourselves in the middle of a moral, political, and cognitive mohole, Don DeLillo's fictional cosmic zone where the physical law is suspended. And indeed, may, we may never get out on the other side. The question is again, what is left of and for us? Help comes paradoxically by putting the post-human moment in the historical long durée of becoming human where it joins all the other punctuating catastrophes. This is the story told, for example, by Roger Smith in Being Human, Historical Knowledge and the Creation of Human Nature, 2011. It is the process sketched across the millennia by Giorgio Agamben in The Open, Man and Animal, 2002, in which he cites Carolus Linnaeus's early 18th century classification of us as human by virtue of our perpetually coming to know ourselves, homo nosce te ipsum. And at the other end of the scale is our every moment's going on being in the anxious construction of self that Anthony Giddens brilliantly describes in Modernity and Self-Identity, 1991. This same anxiety is legible in the attempts, such as Rene Descartes in 1637, to counteract the most corrosive discovery of his age, the great ape. So physiologically similar to humans, physician Nicholas Tulp wrote in 1641 that it would be difficult to find one egg more like another. There is, I think, no more powerful expression of this anxiety than Jonathan Swift's depiction of Lemuel Gulliver, driven insane after willingly embracing 
the lustful, brutish nature he had denied was his in the form of a female yahoo in heat. Ejected by the creatures of perfect reason for copulating with her and so for revealing what he is, he returns home to find himself repelled, and this is a quote, by the smell of that odious animal, his wife, preferring the company and smell of his horses and of the groom who takes care of them. Marvin Minsky reminds us that in making any model of what's happening, as we do when we speak of a crossroads or a plus sign, we must never forget that the modeling relation is ternary. In other words, that our plus sign is three-dimensional, that it signifies nothing independently of us. We are personally, psychologically, individually involved. We are attacked, as Lionel Trilling said, of literature. But for us, the catastrophic attack is no longer animal. Our digital machine has shifted the locus of engagement. In 1970, the Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori, whom I mentioned earlier, proposed that as robots become more recognizably anthropomorphic, react, we react more favorably to them until suddenly their resemblance to us becomes uncanny and so provokes a strongly negative reaction. He called this plunge into fright the uncanny valley phenomenon. Then, and in a recent interview, Maury has emphasized the benefit of deliberately remaining in the uncanny valley so as better to know what it means to be human. Those of you who have seen the Swedish series Ekta Menescore, if you haven't, search it out, it is wonderful. Or Be Right Back from the British Black Mirror 2012-2013, will know how current in our thoughts this valley remains. For us in digital humanities, the locus of engagement may well be, I think it must be, with the embodied artificial intelligence of robots. But my point for now is the uncanny valley which our plus sign denotes. We are, in, a, in other words, at a place of beginnings. All disciplines are, of course, that starting points for mental expanding that is transgressive but not possessive. It doesn't matter so much what you learn, Northrop Fry wrote in On Education, when you learn it in a structure that can expand into other structures. Our structure is the crossroads of techno-scientific and humanistic. That's where we begin. My, hack, my yakking has been all about how we construe our hacking, how we contextualize it, how we expand it into kindred ways of doing in the humanities, in the social and in the natural sciences. This, I think, may well change our priorities. It certainly will push us to rethink some of our projects. For example, all those so-called memory archives in which the tacit model of human remembering is little more than that of an annotated photograph album. What we could do if only we unleashed the power of computing to get uncannily close to the activist idea of remembering developed within the last few decades by neuroscientists, phenomenologists, developmental psychologists, and theoretically aware historians. How we tell stories and what happens when we do that how we construct and reconstruct the past from the memorious world. Phenomenologist Edward S. Casey sums up what ordinary experience tells the observant. Thus far reaches remembering. It stretches as far as we can know. Again, note the participle. It's remembering, as Frederick Bartlett argued against the grain in 1932, not memory. My yakking has been all about our facing up to that computational probe sunk into the nameless and what it brings forth. All of what I've said is to say that we have common cause and common purpose with the venerable humanities, which for the moment have welcomed us in and much to do in puzzling out their evolving relation to our beloved machine, making sure our distinctive voice has something to say and is heard. Scarily, thrillingly, Wonderfully, this is where I think we are, whence we could be going. Thank you very much.